Hi friends, uh, welcome once again to yet another very interesting session at Kosh Company. And as you can see today, we have a guest with us who will again provide us with some sort of an enlightenment. That's the word I would like to use. And uh, we have our guest today, Professor Dr. Deepak Sharma. Welcome Deepak. Thank you so much for joining Ghosh Company. And uh, I would like to tell that Deepak is actually joining us from Cleveland, Ohio. I would like to provide you with a very brief introduction of Dr. Sharma's background. Napoleon many, many years ago has said that uh, religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich. Uh, we will understand today and we will learn that religion is something much beyond that. It has many more things to offer, to be honest. So uh, Dr. Sharma, he's a professor of religious studies at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And he also holds a secondary appointment. He's a professor of bioethics at the School of Medicine. He earned his bachelor's from the Reed College, and then he joined the University of Chicago Divinity School, where he actually received his PhD in uh, religious studies. And he kept on going with his interest in religious studies, and he wrote many books, several book chapters, several articles, and many publications, which essentially focused on the aspects of religion, particularly Hinduism, and Indian philosophy, which is going to be a central aspect of today's discussion. He has many interests here, which span from cultural theory to racism, to Hindu or religious bioethics. And we will come to that point. And when I was doing some research on Deepak, I noticed that he has interest in learning languages. He can actually speak Spanish, German, French, Tulu, and Kannada, and even Sanskrit. And uh, he's very interested in bodybuilding. Uh, I wish I can uh, sh share the pictures with you. And he has been a guest curator of Indian Kaligat painting at the exhibition at the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Museum of Arts. And uh, currently, he's also a curatorial consultant uh, in the same museum. So welcome once again, uh, Deepak. Thank you so much for joining us at Ghosh Company. Oh, thank you very much. You're too kind. And I'm very excited to be here today. Absolutely, we are honored. So uh, to begin with, I would start with some general questions and we should adapt a focal point for our discussion, which is essentially Indian philosophy or Hinduism. To start with, I noticed that your father was a protein crystallographer. That's right. And when you started, you started as a graduate student, actually as a student in engineering and math. From engineering, the epic transition happened to religious studies. If you can tell us a little bit about that transition. Oh, absolutely. So um, uh, having been born and raised in the United States by um, a, a parents who are uh, scientists and scientifically driven, um, it's, it should, should come as no surprise that I was encouraged to pursue the STEM, uh, the, the STEM disciplines, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so throughout my high school years, uh, I, I, although I took classes in the humanities and the social sciences, I didn't really take them very seriously. So, you know, I was taking an English class. It was something secondary and something that, to be somewhat mocked, that it was only an impediment en route to something like going to medical school, being an engineer or being a scientist. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in this connection, I applied for and uh, saw myself um, uh, pursuing disciplines in the sciences. Um, I ended up, of course, as you mentioned, at uh, doing engineering at Cooper Union mm -hmm. and mathematics at NYU. And um, I thought this would be an ideal place to do both. And I was drawn towards Greenwich Village and New York for, without a doubt, reasons that led me to leave engineering and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found was that the vast majority of students that I was uh, in classes with were uh, vocationally driven in a really um, severe way, let's say. So they were severely vocationally driven. And many of them were uh, uh, South Asians like myself mm -hmm. who were pursuing uh, the goal of getting to medical school. Okay. So I remember being in classes and 
I'm looking around. I have, of course, I had already gotten into a pretty a prestigious program. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't thinking about getting into a program where I was surrounded by students who were thinking in those terms. And I began to see um, um, some interesting kind of behavioral dynamics where uh, the night before our chemistry exams, people would pull the fire alarm in the, um, in the dorms okay. to prevent others from studying, right? So there was this very peculiar con kind of competition that seemed to me to go against the very idea of being at a university and studying. So I, I think that, that despite my, my goals to study math and engineering, mm -hmm. my uh, other goal was just to learn and study as many things as I could. And I was surrounded by people who only wanted to study the subjects and disciplines that were relevant for their final pursuit and wanted to prevent others on the way from competing with them. Okay. Right. And so this was a really kind of a shock to me and a disappointment. Right. Um, and I began uh, sort of uh, my, my, my uh, interest and obsession with STEM started unraveling a little bit when I started observing this. I recall I'm speaking with um, a, a TA in a math class mm -hmm. who is no doubt a graduate student. And I was asking him some kind of theoretical questions. You know, how do we know that these things are true? Prove to me that one plus one equals two, these sorts of things. And I recall that this, this TA said to me, you don't need to know any of this. You're just going to be an engineer. And whether or not he could have answered my question is, 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 is questionable. But had he responded in a different way to encourage me to think about more theoretical philosophical issues, even in math, then my, I, my interest in math may have continued. <laughs> but That's instead, right. when he said this, I remember feeling so slighted by this and feeling so, so much uh, me, having been made even more aware of the kind of mm -hmm. vocational dynamics of uh, classes at NYU. So after my first year at NYU, um, I was really kind of disappointed with the way my education was going and that I, I was becoming uh, much more skeptical of my interests in, in engineering and math and vocational training as a whole, let's right. say. Now add to that, and this is an important element to add to this, is that having been brought up at, in that kind of early generation of ABCD Indians, um, I wasn't surrounded with any Indians at all, uh, hardly any, right? So out in Long Island, there might have been six or seven families uh, when I was growing up out there. And now, of course, that's not the way it was, uh, the way it is that's at all. Right. And um, I, uh, this should come as no surprise for people of my generation, is that, that it was hard to identify as Indian. It was very hard to identify as Indian. It was something to be somewhat ashamed of, um, and certainly in the Long Island uh, area, uh, when you said you were an Indian, uh, there was a huge Native American history there. So people just assumed that you were, people would ask me, what tribe are you from? Mm -hmm. And it became embarrassing and, and shameful in a very peculiar way to be Indian. So I remember my parents speaking their native language, Tulu, in the shopping center, and I would feel embarrassed by this. I don't know these people and so on. Or seeing my mom wearing a sari was a place of embarrassment. And people, of course, targeted us and made fun of us and, you know, our houses smelled like curry powder and what have mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So I had a very peculiar relationship with being Indian and with India. So much so that I was very skeptical of it. <laughs> I thought I didn't want to identify with this. It's important for me to add that in high school, when I was um, uh, uh, still in the STEM classes, I, I, it, it, you'll find this interesting, is that I was in my senior year, I was initially enrolled in AP English, as okay. would be only expected. But then I thought to myself, well, this is not going to be very useful for me. I mean, who cares about AP English? I want to become a scientist or an engineer. And I dropped to a, a, a you know, general English class for, meant for general students, not for AP. But I excelled in that class, right? I was the top student in the class. And my teacher um, took a liking to me and realized that I probably didn't belong there in the same way. I probably should have been an AP. And he started suggesting books for me to read. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading, um, uh, he, he, he turned me on to, uh, to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Ken Kesey. And this led to Jack Kerouac on the road and to other books of that sort, okay? Right. 
And this began, and I remember reading the Dharma Bumps by Jack Kerouac. And there's a curiosity about India and South Asia and Buddhism and so on in these books. And this was very confusing to me. I mean, what's there to be ashamed of if the books that I'm reading are praising India, yet when I, it's, it was very confusing. So um, this is percolating in the back of my mind that there are other ways to look at the world that aren't vocationally driven and that stem out of the beatnik kind of uh, narratives mm -hmm. and eventually become part of like the late 60s, uh, early 70s narrative. <clears throat> and this I start observing and seeing in my first year at NYU here and there. And I start seeing that there are people who are um, musically interested um, in music, uh, rather uh, musicians who are interested in music that is Indian and that they are dressing as in kind of Indian styles, that they're Indian tapestries. And there's a lot of Indian imagery in some of these worlds. And it, this is com very confusing for me because I've left Stony Brook embarrassed about being an Indian. And now I see that, that being an Indian is something that these musicians and their fans look up towards. So this is tremendously confusing, tremendously confusing for me. By the end of my first year of college at NYU, the uh, seed of doubt about STEM has entered my mind. And a, another kind of seed, though not of doubt, about maybe India is not so bad has entered my mind as well. Um, uh, it so happens that my father, who you mentioned was a protein crystallographer, he was a professor at Stony Brook, was on sabbatical in California at Genentech okay. in Burlingame, right? So they make a deal with me. They said, you can't stay at NYU uh, or New York uh, that summer, the summer after your first year, come live with us. <clears throat> and they're living, of course, in California at the time, come live with us, they said. And I'm reluctant to go because who wants to live with your parents in this way, especially when I'm not able to see my friends from high school. Right. And I make a deal with them that I'll go if and only if they send me to Berkeley for summer school. And, um, and that I'll stay with them for a short period and then I get to go live in Berkeley and go to Berkeley summer school, which of course connects nicely with this books I'm reading and the Jack Kerouac sort of world that I'm also inhabiting in another space in my mind. So I, I ended up in Berkeley Summer School. And um, I remember I was taking uh, linear algebra and okay. uh, C plus, I think, C plus, uh, you know, this language, it's computer yes, language. The computer language. And, and after a week of this, I, I just was not interested in it at all. I said, this is not interesting for me. I don't want to do this. And I remember calling up my parents and they met me. Um, are you familiar with Berkeley? They met me outside of um, um, Davidson Hall. <clears throat> okay. And, and I remember sitting, about it. Yeah, I'm sitting in their car and telling them that I cannot do engineering and math anymore. I need to do something different. And they cried. We all cried. You know, they said, what's okay. going to happen to this boy? You know, this sort of thing. And um, I happened to um, uh, have, they gave me permission to switch into new classes. And I switched into um, <clears throat> history of California and introduction to music. Okay. The first time that I had ever switched into a non-STEM class by choice. Right. And I had taken an interest in the history class. So my father asked me, what is it you want to study? And out of, on a whim, I said, well, maybe I'll do history. And he okay. said to me, well, do this if and only if you get a PhD. Don't get a bachelor's degree in, in the humanities and think that it's going to end there. You must go on and get a higher degree. Otherwise, what, what will you do for your, for your career? So I agreed, not knowing really what I had agreed to. Right? I said, okay. yes, yeah, sure, PhD. Now, I should say as an aside, and this is important to mention, um, is that uh, in high school, in my last year of high school, and certainly my first year at NYU, uh, this music that I was mentioned that was, uh, there was an orientation towards India was um, the, the, the uh, musical, the band called The Grateful Dead, which you may okay. or may not have heard of, right? So I was a deadhead is what they call the fans of the dead. And of course, I had an ulterior motive by going to Berkeley for summer school because I knew that I could see lots of Grateful Dead shows there. And sure enough, my parents sent me to Berkeley summer school and I start seeing lots of Grateful Dead shows. And there are scores of people there who are wearing Indian clothing, thinking about India, 
talking about Indian things in a kind of classic hippie appropriation sort mm -hmm. of way, right? Mm -hmm. And this is confusing, right? Because after all, I have rejected India, but here are these people that I'm looking up towards and music that I'm looking uh, that I enjoy, and they are embracing India. So this is tremendously confusing for me, um, but it's giving me a new sense to. So in the same way that one can rediscover right. one's one's heritage um, through someone else's eyes, right? I suppose I rediscovered uh, my Indian heritage when I saw that other people thought it was interesting. So this is a peculiar post-colonial, post-post-colonial sort of sense, right? At any rate, um, it so happens that the Grateful Dead were touring that, that summer, and I joined them on tour, one could okay. say. And I toured up to uh, Oregon. Okay. Um, and this is probably the, the kind of the most interesting part of the story that I'm sharing with you. So I'm in Oregon. And I, there's a show in Eugene, and there's a show in Tacoma, and we end up staying, I, I'm dry, going with a friend that I met from Berkeley, and we stay in somebody's apartment in Portland. Okay. And who happens to go to school in Portland. And um, we wake up one of the mornings, and he said, let's go look at this school and see what it's like. And we go, and of course, that's Reed College. And, you know, I look around, and it's amazing. It's a beautiful school, and people look to be left-wing and liberal in the ways that I am now finding to be interesting. And it doesn't look so STEM-oriented, and it looks like it's very, very far away from New York. <laughs> okay. So I make it back to NYU with the idea that maybe I'll transfer to Reed College. Okay. And at NYU, I'm no longer doing engineering and math. And I think I took a class in Hinduism. I okay. took a class in uh, on death and dying, I remember. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I took, yeah, and I took a class on Marxism, right? What a great okay. combination of things to do. And by the end of that semester at NYU, I am sure that I won't be studying um, uh, engineering and math or anything STEM. And I, uh, I, I end up transferring to Reed College uh, the following semester. So that's to say the, the second semester of my sophomore year, I begin at Reed College. And I enroll in a class, a Hinduism class there too, mm -hmm. to see what this would be like with a professor named Edwin Giraud, okay. who is absolutely essential to, this, to these transitions and these epic transitions. Mm -hmm. And um, Giraud happened to be a Sanskritist at the University of Chicago, who had retired from Chicago and was grabbed by the, the Reed College faculty and asked to teach there. Okay. So he was accustomed to teaching graduate students. Like, so he was a graduate school professor at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. now teaching Reed College students. And um, he starts, I'm, I'm one of very few Indian students at Reed College at that time period. Okay. And he starts asking me questions about my background. Who are you? Deepak Sharma, where are you? You must be Punjabi, these sorts of things. All right. And I say, no, I think I'm from South India. We eat masal dosas, I remember telling him. Right. <laughs> right. So this line of questioning continues. And Jero, uh, and once a week, I'm calling up my parents on the dorm phone, right? You know, there's a phone in the dorm, and, you know, mom and dad, you know, Jero has asked me this mm. question, can you answer it? And Jero is able to, through this question and answer, kind of this samvada, this debate and dialogue, he discovers, and he helps me discover, that I'm South Indian, and that I'm from Udupi, and that I'm a Madhva. Uh, I'm, so I'm born into the Madhva tradition, and it just so happens that Professor Jiro was also someone who had studied Madhva Vedanta. And he had studied with a teacher, Bananjay Govindacharya, who just passed away recently. Mm -hmm. And Govindacharya lives behind my uncle's house. <clears throat> and that his Jiro's uh, kind of assistant, not assistant, but uh, connection in Urupi was my father's um, social studies teacher when he was in high school there. Okay. So everything just collapses together in a really beautiful sort of package, right? Like a nice masala dosa. Like, Absolutely. Right. That's, that's a nice right. and Jero And Jero realizes that, that my, some of the questions that I'm asking mm -hmm. uh, in general are about realism versus idealism, whether or not things really exist independently of your mind. And this is no doubt something that comes out of conversations that you find in kind of Grateful Dead worlds and at Reed College. It's a classic conversation. And he said to me, I know you're interested in this question. Why don't you look at this question 
in terms of the debate between the Advaita school and at the Dwaita school of Vedanta, Advaita being idealism, Dwaita being realism. And you can uh, not only satisfy your philosophical uh, query, but you can also learn something about your heritage. And I am bitten by this Indian philosophical religious studies bug. Um, I also should point out, and this is of tremendous importance, is that when I transferred to Reed, I thought I would just fall around the Grateful Dead and drop out of society and disappear. But if you know something about Reed College, it is um, extraordinarily um, academically driven, right? And I am bitten by that bug. So I couldn't imagine doing anything else but my best possible work and pursuing a PhD in religious studies and taking these matters with tremendous seriousness. And Jerome encourages me to do it. So the next stop is returning to India and studying with Bananjay Govindacharya, my relative, my teacher's guide, and so on, and we're learning about the Madhva School of Vedanta and revisiting, relearning my heritage, as it were. And the next stop is the University of Chicago. So that's a, a kind of a long version of what happened, right? So I have, I have really two people to thank in a funny sort of way, is the, the TA at NYU who really didn't answer my question well, and then my parents for, or my father for taking a sabbatical in Genentech because I ended up in Berkeley and traveling around as I did. Right, so uh, he certainly didn't expect that, right? <laughs> so that's a bit of how I ended up what I'm doing, what I'm doing. It's a beautiful way, uh, the way you have explained it, and you have mentioned certain aspects, I'll come to it, which by definition leads to the subsequent questions. First of all, uh, what I have learned from this whole story is uh, if someone uh, doesn't answer my question properly, uh, I should ponder more on that. Uh, like uh, you're thanking your TA, and it's remarkable, like, as we say, like it's destiny primed. <laughs> somehow the events happened and it somehow led you to the religious studies and you rejected the STEM courses in engineering. That's right. And we are chatting today exactly on that aspect. And uh, we, we, before going into the Vedanta aspect, I want to ask you something as a transitory question. Uh, you mentioned something about the confusion that we face as, uh, you know, the typical, the as we are referred as the immigrants' children. Irrespective of the fact, if you are, I have noticed that I'm the first generation who has come to North America. You are probably not the first generation, but there's a huge overlap between some of the observations that you made. And I like the word when you used Confucian, that people ask me this question as well. Even today, if I walk on the street, they will ask me. They will probably connect with me with my... Uh, if it's a festival and I'm, I'm actually wearing some sort of like a dhoti kurta kind of a dress, or if I visit a temple, then of course the chances of getting those questions are higher. That, you know, are you a Hindu? Okay, what kind of food do you eat? Okay, if you're a Hindu, uh, when I say that, you know, I'm a Bengali by ethnicity. Okay, if you're a Bengali, then uh, why do you go to uh, a Gurdwara? But I heard that Indians are from South. They eat masala dosa, as you mentioned. So there is a sense of confusion about what is India? And if I go deeper down, what is actually Hinduism? So why, they, why it's so diverse? And that creates a lot of confusion in the people or in the non-Hindu tradition. What exactly is Hinduism and why it seems confusing? Right, that's a great question. So, um... Uh, and a, a, a very controversial one, <laughs> right? So, so Hinduism um, is confusing because the term Hinduism is a relatively new one. And the very idea of religion in and of itself is also a new development, really, of the last 150 years as a product of Christian missionaries who were observing traditions across the world and comparing them with Christianity. Okay, so the term religion was initially used to describe only one thing, which was Christianity. And in the observation of, of people's behaviors that looked like Christianity, the term religions developed, right? Okay. So suddenly you had um, a, a plurality of things mm -hmm. that all seemed to share something essential. There are instances of religion and there are religions. And the, the, the Christian missionaries and the first scholars of Hinduism uh, brought with them a template about what a religion ought to have and how should it look. 
and naturally they used Christianity as their paradigm. So a good religion should have a God, should have a book, and should have priests. Right. And really, quite simply, they looked for that in South Asia. And as long as it fit the template or they forced it to fit the template. And you had then the construction of Hinduism through the eyes of outsiders who used the, the Christian template as the paradigm, right? So many times I've heard still today, um, people will say to me, oh, you're a Hindu. We like, what's your Bible? So people will ask. And that phrase, what's your Bible, is a, like a perfect example of the Christian template being the norm, right? And typically uh, what's answered and what was answered partly because of British interest and partly because of um, uh, the people that they were interviewing is they would say the Bhagavad Gita is the Bible of India, right? And this makes a little sense to us now because we've absorbed this and we've accepted it. But right. if we think about the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita is not the Bible and it's not the Bible of Hinduism either, right? There are lots of texts. Right? Lots of texts. Lots of texts. And uh, circumscribing a body of texts as the canon is artificial and is really another sort of way of imposing or, uh, yes, imposing a Christian template on multiplicity. So you had this interesting um, enlightenment, and I use enlightenment here in terms of the French enlightenment. So enlightenment desire to categorize and to create a taxonomy that gets reified. And religion and religions are yes. taxonomies that are reified and invented and reified. And Hinduism is a kind of paradigmatic example of a humanly invented category that is a product of the Enlightenment that has become reified and now has this kind of complexity and confusion of non-uniformity, right? So you had this drive to find uniformity. After all, that's kind of an enlightenment thing to do. And you have all of these traditions within the South Asian subcontinent, which people are practicing all sorts of things. Some pradayas, if, they're, if, to want to, if you want to get yes. technical. And they're practicing and believing so many different things. There's some overlap, like Venn diagrams. And there's some cases where there's no overlap at all. But they're all within South Asia. And within the gaze of the, the Christian missionaries and the British, for sure, they are all doing something that appears to them to be similar. And after all, the people that they interview to ask what do these people believe are uh, largely Brahmin priests. Mm -hmm. And these Brahmins, of course, um, not surprisingly, are representing uh, their own traditions with which they're most familiar and which are uh, systematized because Brahminical classical Hinduism is somewhat systematic. You've got these classic texts, you've got Shruti, you've got Smriti, and so on, right? And so they offer this as Hinduism, and it fits nicely into the, the, the template. I, I, I came across this really phenomenal document when I was uh, teaching at Yale in the library okay. there, and it was called the Hindu, uh, the Madhva Catechism, and okay. it's got the Ten Commandments of Madhva Vedanta, right? But just that idea thinking like, well, what are your Ten Commandments, is, is the Christian template. So you have this multiplicity of practices and beliefs in South Asia, and now India, if you want to call that, which is another British construction, right? And there's a, there's a, a drive to find unity in that multiplicity, both by the British scholars and by those who are speaking on behalf of Hinduism. So you have the reification of Hinduism, and in particular, you also have this up against a um, up against Muslims and Christians, because after all, when the British are in the picture and they're doing taxonomies and and uh, census sorts of things to figure out, you know, which groups are going to dominate in terms of laws and so on, mm -hmm. are you a a, a Hindu, a Christian, or a Muslim? So you have people who never ever saw themselves as Hindu because it wasn't there to identify with, now identify as Hindu. 
merely to find themselves to, to be in opposition against Christianity That's and Islam. Right. So you have this thing being generated. And um, by the time of the early 20th century, we have um, some semi-accepted catechisms, so to speak, of what Hindus believe. And they'll, people will say Hindus believe in the truth of the Vedas, which is <clears throat> come to become true. It's, it has become sort of true. Mm -hmm. But you have scores of Hindus who don't think the Vedas are the most important text or who have rejected the Vedas. And I think of Kancha Ilaya, the, um, the, the, the Dalit um, uh, author, who rejects all of these paradigms and denies being a Hindu, right? At any rate, so all of these things happen. And by, um, um, by um, independence, you have Radha Krishnan, who of course is the president of India, who is an Advaitan, mm -hmm. and who, has, who sees so beautifully and so brilliantly that one way to unify India, because it needs to be unified, is of course to propose or to, 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 to suggest that Advaita Vedanta is the right paradigm to think of when one thinks of Hinduism, because it involves multiplicity and unity at the same time, right? So you have unity, finally, when everything is one, India is one, yet right. there is multiplicity and you have lots of states, lots of languages, lots of practices. And so the kind of birth of Hinduism is uh, largely because of the outside, in a way. And then you have a particular tradition of Hinduism that dominates and that fits a nationalist narrative, right? And I think India needed that nationalist narrative because you need unity in that multiplicity. So that's that's kind of the the kind of historical etymology one could say. I think uh, what you mentioned is a beautiful way of redefining Hinduism, the way you said, because it's very hard to impinge what Hinduism is. Isn't like you know you put ten words to summarize. It's it's hard. But I like the idea that you mentioned about comparing something with respect to a template. Maybe it's a Christian template. And now while you were speaking to me. I was thinking that if we, from a, from a very Indian perspective, if I look into the cuisines, if I look into the architecture, uh, we have a tendency of putting things into the template. Like, for example, in Southern India, in Eastern India, if you go, come to my city, Calcutta, there is a tremendous fascination about the British architecture. And we still know that our Indian constitution, there are certain defects because the constitution was based on the template of the British constitution before right. independence. So right. that, that kind of makes sense to me. Right, it's, I mean, in a way, it's, it's classically post-colonial, right? I mean, it's, it is. It's, it's like perfectly post-colonial, is that there's a peculiar relationship with the colonizer, an appropriation, and um, one could say that the, either the perfume or the stench of the colonizer remains in funny ways. And you see this throughout India, especially the kind of um, Victorian sense of sexuality in mm -hmm. India is largely a British Victorian hangover. Right? Yes, of course. Uh, right. And, and then you think about the Kaligat paintings, which, which you mentioned that I, I, I curated, is that many of the Kaligat paintings were observations of the, the Babus in Bengal who, who were... Um, appropriating British mannerisms to such an extreme that they looked absurd, right? Um, um, and I think what Homi Baba calls this um, mimicry or mockery, right? So are you mimicking or mocking? And if you're mimicking, then you really are buying into still being colonized. If you're mocking, then you're post-colonial, right? And so much of India is, 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 uh, has been, um, uh, um, moving between mimicking and mocking, right? And you're right, kind of the architectural styles, absolutely, this was mimicking. <laughs> and we, we still love it. And coming back to uh, uh, the Kalikat uh, temples or the paintings, I'll come to that. I should tell you something which is very, very interesting. That is a coincidence, I would say, that when I was actually researching about you, before even jumping to your web page or blog, I was searching for some keywords. And one of my keywords, was Kali. And the first search that the Google picked up is Kali Ghat and it connected me with your webpage. 
Now, what is even more interesting that the place where I grew up in Calcutta is a stone's throw distance from the famous Kalighat temple. Wow. When we talk about Kali, there is a division also in the general population, even among the Hindu population, I would say, that we associate Kali with evil powers. Is she good or bad? So if you can clarify that part. So the goddess Kali, for sure, has uh, the Western um, Orientalist imagination has embraced that in all the wrong ways, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is that you've got fear, you've got violence, you've got blood, you've got eroticism. And then you see this exemplified in um, Indiana Jones uh, um, films where Kali is re represented in these ways. And, and the kind of fear that, uh, of the other is represented there in savagery and all these sorts of things. Um, and it, it, has, it, it fills then, it plays the, the, the goddess Kali plays this role in the Western imagination about the, the, the dangerous Orientalist or you know, the dangerous Orient or mystical East, what have you. Interestingly, in recent times, you have uh, uh, American Western feminists mm -hmm. who've also embraced Kali for slightly different reasons where, uh, as a kind of, not response to the Me Too movement, but you know, a powerful woman who, uh, is, whose violence is, is to be feared, um, not in a bad way, but in a good way, right? Uh, and, and correlating blood and violence and women's power. So you have this happening as well. Now, um, Kali, as I said, has um, always uh, been a focal point for um, uh, judgment about Hinduism in India. And the British observed uh, 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 sacrifice in the Kali temple and the goddess Kali as a justification for colonization. Right? Like, look at this. And you're right when you think about Vivekananda, who is positing Neo-Vedanta mm -hmm. uh, uh, partly as a way to satisfy um, the kind of, um, not satisfy, to address this sort of judgment sensibility of the British and of Europeans and proposing a kind of philosophical position that's elegant and that is able to explain away the, um, uh, the, the plurality of Hinduism the, the multiplicity of gods and, and goddesses and, um, um, and the, 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 the scary images suddenly become symbolic and finally you can do away with all of them. And those who are more sophisticated um, don't buy into those things in the first place. But, but Vivekananda um, and other Neo-Vedantins are speaking uh, to an intellectual uh, group of Europeans and Americans who wants Hinduism to be more philosophical. And if it's more philosophical, then it's going to be more refined. And in fact, um, it'll create its own caste system where the philosophical um, who are uh, uh, not like on the ground worshipers of Kali are uh, very, it's like kind of, a, it's like a Plato Republic where the, the philosophical elite, and then you have the masses who do something else. And um, this reminds me, of really two things is that that the British and the Germans were really interested in Advaita Vedanta because it was so radically different from what they were used to, right? It wasn't your normal sort of Christian sense where there's a God and you believe in God and so on. And suddenly you have something that has no God per se, uh, and it's very different. So Schopenhauer and others were very fascinated with Advaita Vedanta and in a peculiar way, helped popularize it by making it their object of study. <clears throat> and so in the same way that I start being interested in India because the Grateful Dead and Deadheads are looking at India, is that you have Indians who are interested in Advaita because the Germans and the British are looking at Advaita Vedanta. So Vivekananda is, is jumping on that and using that, uh, one could say, surfing that wave, one could say, um, and, 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 and trying to make Hinduism um, more kind of philosophical and refined for both an Indian audience that wants something more philosophical and refined and a Western audience that also wants something more philosophical and refined. Um, and I think that that is one way to do away with goddess Kali. <laughs> yes, certainly. And you have touched upon one very important facet. You have mentioned